place is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. Vamos. It's a Wednesday morning, the day before Thanksgiving. Question on the floor, and thank you uh, to your good friend Clayton for dropping this on us this morning on Twitter. What are you thankful for in the world of soccer, whether it's Atlanta United related or MLS related or U.S. national team related or just in general, just whatever in the soccer world you're thankful for? Go ahead and send it our way on Twitter at soccer down here and let us know. We'll be getting into that. We'll get you caught up on all the moves around the league yesterday. A former Atlanta United player has a new home Rumors are continuing to swirl. A couple new ones we'll get into this morning. And anything else that's on your mind? It's a Wall Pass Wednesday. It is a, a Wednesday in the middle of a holiday week. It is a Wednesday in the middle of an off season where things can get sideways and twisted around and spun around backwards and all kinds of things. That's what happens. So you guys can take it there however you want. So tweet at us at soccer down here. Let us know. Jason Longshore, John Nelson with you this morning. And, John, let's get caught up on the reentry draft first. Let's get the news of the day from yesterday. And the number one pick was one that we talked about and not surprised by at all. Mikey Ambrose goes to Miami. They made the trade to get the pick. They had to have a pretty good idea. I mean, I think when you started doing the math about who's going to get protected, who's not going to get protected, you could – get a pretty good sense back when they made that trade as to who would be available. And Mikey Ambrose, being in Orlando with Paul McDonough, being in Atlanta with Paul McDonough, is a player that Paul McDonough knows very, very well and a player who will fit right into enter Miami's back line and provide depth and quality starts when called upon. Yeah, and you know, piecing it together and you're adding one plus one and you come up with Mikey Ambrose. And you know, as I said yesterday, yeah, you. I'm looking forward to seeing what this new start is for him. Loved his time here. Loved what he was able to contribute, and you just want to see that continue to grow and evolve. Now in his next stop, and now he gets to do it with a a startup that has uh, been saying publicly that they're going to hit the ground running, similar to a situation that he was in previously. So, you know the the relationship with McDonough, and I had forgotten the Orlando relationship uh, part of the whole thing, but. Yeah, you, know, you add Paul McDonough, Inter Miami, Mikey Ambrose. Not a shock that he went number one. Yeah, not a shock at all. Um, a player that expected to go somewhere in the draft, he goes number one. Another player that we talked about yesterday that I expected to go due to his versatility. Nashville moved up, making a trade. They traded their second round pick in the twenty twenty two Super Draft. One of the craziest things to to dish out and Vancouver was willing to take it they get Eric Miller right back who can play on the left side can even play some center back in a pinch can play center back in a three-man back line which is something that we expect Nashville and Gary Smith to employ smart move from Nashville they didn't have a right back on the roster Miller provides that and he provides that versatility and veteran experience he was one of the players that when you started looking at contract numbers, he made a ton of sense to go in stage one of the reentry draft. Pass stops, Montreal, Colorado, Minnesota United, New York City, 115 appearances, six years in the league. You're getting that kind of a veteran presence. And, you know, once again, from listening to you and putting pieces together with what uh, Gary wants to do with his back line, picking up someone like Miller, once again, not a surprise. Yeah, he gives you a ton of versatility. So, and you're giving up a second round pick in a draft in three years. Yeah, go for it. Sure, Easy move. Easy one to make. Uh, backup goalkeepers likely uh, are the other two picks. Although Kendall McIntosh with the Red Bulls could have the potential to compete with Ryan Mara for the number one shirt. With Luis Robles gone, uh, Richard Sanchez was picked up by Sporting Kansas City. He'll be battling it out with Eric Dick for the backup spot behind Tim Melia. Those are the types of picks you generally see in stage one of the reentry draft. Players who are on comfortable contracts, players who are on salary numbers that you're okay taking on. And stage two is where you might get a little more speculative picks where you're looking at guys that, okay, we'll, we'll take this player. We'd like to renegotiate now. That's what you'll see next week in stage two. But Thought around four or five guys who might get picked in this one. It's four. It was about typical for the reentry draft in stage one. Now, uh, 
once again, the, the rules for stage one is that you have to either exercise the option or extend a legit offer. You can't just camp out on somebody, right? Yeah, the legit offer is a little more detailed. Um, and this is where you'd love to have the MLS rules annotated. Uh, genuine offer is what's described for the waiver draft and for stage two of the reentry draft. Bonafide offer is what is said for stage one, but I've also seen it worded as a contract that cannot be less than what they made last year if they are out of contract. If they have an option, you're picking up the option. Those are very easy. You don't have to go back and look at each one if it matters onto option or not option. But if they're out of contract and you pick them in reentry stage one, I've seen it described as you have to pick them up minimum at the number they made in 2019. I've also seen it described as a bona fide offer. Maybe that's how they define bona fide offers. It has to start at this floor. Don't know. It changes, though, to a genuine offer for stage two, which I I don't know how they judge that. um, But that's what you have to extend to keep their rights within the league. So you can't see, and this is the, you know, I was going to sit here and say, well, you can't quote unquote lowball somebody, but you know, it's the, the whole idea of the bona fide offer here. And, you definitely or, can't. I think yeah. in the, the waiver pickups and the stage two pickups, it's a different conversation about what you can offer them and what is considered genuine here. There, there's definitely more of a, a high bar in what you have to offer. And, I don't know if that's word for word in the rules about the 2019 contract number, but that's what I've seen multiple times is they have to make at least what they made the previous year. They can't, you can't pick them up and then keep them at a pay cut. Right. So that's, that's the thing to look out for when it comes to players that are selected and going into the MLS uh, PA website and seeing what their salary figures were in previous years to see what the the baseline is for trying to introduce them to a new club with a salary figure right and and all of these were were comfortable ones none of these were were too too crazy now we do have a trade from yesterday fc dallas acquired the rights to fafa pico from philadelphia in exchange for 300000 of 2020 GAM. The Union could also get an additional 75000 in 21 GAM. If Pico meets certain performance metrics, he's out of contract with the Union. Um, he was one that I don't think was listed anywhere specifically because he was negotiating a new deal with the Union. So he wasn't listed as a free agent, re-entry, what have you. I think he would have gone through the re-entry process, uh, but he opted out because this is the move they end up making for him. You're going to expect to see him sign with FC Dallas if they're going to give up this this kind of loot for him. And, and Pico goes into a very crowded FC Dallas wing and forward grouping. I'll be curious to see what it ends up looking like for Luchi Gonzalez when he has on the left wing Santiago Mosquera, on the right wing Michael Barrios, who's one of the top players in the league. He's got Fafa Pico who can play on the right wing. He has young players in Dante Sealy and Emma Twomasi. He's got attacking midfield options like Paxton Pomacall. Pablo Aranguis is out on loan, but they still have him under contract. Another young option in Thomas Roberts. Up top, he has the Cobra. Zdenek Ondrasik. He has Jesus Ferreira, who scored a, a good number of goals as a teenager. Um, he has Ricardo Pepe, another young, exciting player who scored a ton of goals with North Texas. He has Francis Atuahene, who hasn't really had an opportunity yet and has had some injuries. He maybe, air quotes, had Dominique Baji, who posted a goodbye message on his Instagram yesterday, so maybe Pico's dropping into that spot. But it's not going to be the same amount of guaranteed playing time as Pico had in Philadelphia with Mosquera Barrios on the wings, with Pomacall, Roberts in the hole behind the forwards, and if you're going with two up top, you're still competing Pico with Andrasic, with Ferreira, with Pepe. 
going to be interesting to see how Luchi Gonzalez divides the minutes up. And at the same time, Tafka is looking at the flip side of that equ- uh, equation. He's saying, man, Philly's tearing down their best success. What a bummer. Well, I mean, you had a lot of guys out of contract, and that's that's the struggle here is I don't think they're tearing it down. I think they just can't keep everybody. You know, they. this is where it comes back to some of that next-level planning when you're a front office of you don't want all your deals coming up at the same time. And it's tough when you're an expansion team because you're, you're kind of limited in how much you can scale guys. But when you're Philadelphia and, and you went out and you, you came up into this year with, you know, Marco Fabian didn't work out the way they hoped it would. That happens. That one, okay. But Medunian, you make the decision not to keep him another year or two. Now Pico, who is out of contract, you know, the Corey Burke situation was, was an unlucky element, but that opened up a spot for Casper Shabilko, and he's made the most of it. Pico, I don't know if you're necessarily tearing it down by losing him because what happens, and when they went to the four four two diamond, it, it wasn't the greatest of fits for Pico. But you look at Philadelphia and, and what they're going to have to do next year, and you, you break out their depth chart a little bit. Your replacements are going to come more from the central midfield than the wings and, and Pico I think is best in a four two three one out wide on the right or the left depending on if you want him inverted or not you don't really have that in Philadelphia playing a four four two diamond most of the time you've got to replace Medunian right now you've got to figure out are you going to be able to keep Jamiro Montero he's, he was with you on loan or are you going to lose him too because your diamond has two pieces with Bedoya and with Brendan Aronson, but nothing else. And then you don't really have much depth either. You have Warren Kerval, you have Cole Turner, young player. You have wingers who are going to be more likely up top options for you in Ingalina and Jack DeVries. You have Anthony Fontana, who's a, a younger player than Aronson, hasn't really gotten that time yet. Up top, you've got options, and that's why losing Pico is not dramatic. You have Shabilko, you have Sergio Santos, you brought in Andrew Vooten late in the season, and you're hoping to get Corey Burke back if you can figure out the, the immigration status situation with him, which is still one of the crazier stories of the 2019 season. But the midfield and in that diamond of four, that's what the union have to figure out, and you're going to be leaning on Ernst Tanner and his Rolodex. And you're probably going to have to go outside the league to get the players to fit. But for Philadelphia, the number six is the most important spot. If they're able to get the right guy to replace Madunian and, and somebody who can give you most of what he gave you from a passing perspective, but more than what he gave you as a defensive number six, they'll be fine. They still have to add a lot of depth, too. And that's the other thing about Philadelphia is you look at where they are right now. Goalkeeper, you're good. Backline, you've got Wagner and Gaddis as your outside backs that are going to start good. You have Olivio and Baizo and Matt Real, Matt Real as your, your outside backs, as backups, okay. You only have two center backs. You have McKenzie and Elliott. You need depth there. You know, do you have some coming through the academy? Do you have some at Bethlehem Steel? It's very possible the union have done a good job in that side. But you're going to have to figure that out quickly as well. So you need a six. You need an eight. Or you need to bring Jamira Montero back. You need midfield depth. You need defensive depth. It's a lot of shopping for uh, Ernst Tanner to do in the offseason. And as you were bringing it up, the thought that was going through my head was the Academy and Bethlehem Steel and seeing who might be on the road to being on an MLS roster. And I know that you and I have gotten the chance to take a peek at Bethlehem, but it was in a schedule compression situation and it was kind of a difficult read to figure out what what's there from Bethlehem when they came to play Atlanta United too. But yeah, for me, the, the lean is to look at the academy and, and Bethlehem Steel and see if that can help you in any way. It's a tough jump. I mean, 
you know, yeah, you're looking for depth roles here, but that's still a big jump from USL Championship or Academy, even Academy, getting USL Championship experience to being able to truly provide depth at the first team level in MLS. So I, I think you're going to be looking, if you're Philadelphia, at some of the guys that are available in the second stage of the reentry draft and some of the free agents and guys who, who get through reentry and waiver and, and are available. I think you're going to need some of those veterans to, to bridge the gap. You know, we mentioned a, a Jonathan Campbell and Alex Cronialle as center back depth options yesterday that are available in the reentry draft. Those are guys that Philadelphia should be considering. I think they need at least one center back who they can expect to step in if an injury happens to McKenzie or Elliott, or just to give them a break from time to time. Yeah. You know, you need a veteran there, and if you have a young guy you can sign as well, cool. Then you've got a, a group that works pretty well. You were mentioning FC Dallas. Uh, Matt Hedges is going to be hanging around for another couple of years. Yeah, new three-year deal using TAM. Um, club options for 23 and 24. Hedges could be one of those guys that spends his entire career with FC Dallas. And that's that's a good thing to see. I mean, Hedges is a player that I think some have expected to potentially be a guy who could make it to Europe. I, I don't think he's quite at that point. He's very close and in the right situation. I, I think he can play. I think he can handle that. But if his whole career is in Dallas, it's not a bad thing either. And, and I think that's something that you know we have to understand in American soccer. That's good too. And if he's, he's on a TAM deal, he's going to be getting paid nicely. That means he's getting over... $530,000 a year. He's got security. He's a guy who can play in the national team and has been in the mix for the national team. These things are good. And, and I think it's a sign of the growth of the league that for a guy like Matt Hedges, he doesn't feel like, you know what, I have to go take a bad deal and go to a lesser club in Europe. I'm happy here and I'm being paid well to be here. I'm good. I'm good. This is the best place for me. And there were an, another couple of moves yesterday, and one that I thought was a, a cool one was the one that happened up at NYCFC. When that came across in my email, I'm like, okay, that's that's, a, that's another feather in the cap for NYCFC with a, a 17-year-old in Tavon Gray. Yeah, fourth homegrown signing for NYC in their club's history, and this is the first one from the Bronx. Tavon Gray, center back, U17, international. Very cool when you get that kind of of localness in your group um and just a great story about him glenn crooks had a great piece over at pro soccer usa kind of digging into him and i i love the story that sam pugsley their academy director told about gray he said that you know he's he has a joy of being on the field and he's always playing with a big smile but he told a story about Gray playing up with the 19s, they were sharing space with the, the U-12s. And, and Pugsley said, Tavon sat down with the 12s and started asking their names and doing different handshakes with them. It was unprompted. For me, that's the type of family atmosphere and the type of leadership that you want from your older players. And to see a, a teenager get what his role is in that academy and be able to pass that on to the youngest group in the academy... They get what the club is all about, and that's very, very cool to see. And he's a guy, when you look at the the opportunities that are in front of him at New York City, you know, think back to last year. We didn't expect to see James Sands as a regular for New York City at this point last year. We didn't expect to see a player like that be such an important part. Gray could be one of those kinds of players. You know, the the depth at center back, and some of it is going to depend on if they play three in the back, which is what Dome Tarrant went to, and that's what opened up the spot for Sands. Instead of Sebastian Ibiaga, both of them are back with Alexander Callens and Maxime Cheneau. Gray slots in. 
first year as a pro, I think he'll probably spend time on loan in, in USL League One or the USL Championship. But this preseason, you know, NYC's made the point now that we don't care about your age. If you're good enough, you're going to play. And he has that opportunity just like Sands does, just like Joe Scally does before he makes the move over to Germany next year. Any young player in this group, hey, the door's open. Take it. Yeah, as long as I said, when I when I saw that come across in my emails yesterday, I'm like, you know, homegrown and from the Bronx. For me, that was that was uh, one of the moments that you sit there and you go, nicely done, and it's a great development for NYCFC. While yeah, you have homegrowns, that's great, but to have the the local homegrown, that's the strong part for me. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a special bonus. Um, Seattle Sounders also acquired backup goalkeeper Stefan Cleveland. Second round pick in the Super Draft goes to the Chicago Fire um, in exchange for a first round Super Draft pick, which is number 26. So, sorry, Seattle sends the 26 pick in the Super Draft to Chicago for Cleveland and a second round pick. Um, That level of pick in the Super Draft, eh, I mean, it's nine spots. It's it's a little bit of a crapshoot when you get to that point. It can happen. We've seen third round picks end up sticking and we've seen picks that are in the the top 15 not stick so the super draft is still a tough one for a lot of different clubs to truly predict but Seattle picking up the rights to Cleveland he goes into the backup role behind Stefan Fry he'll be competing with Trey Muse for that number two shirt in Seattle there's rumors all over the place. We'll get into those. We'll get into your questions on a Wall Pass Wednesday edition of SDH, but we're going to take a quick break. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here, November 27th. Silly season. Rumors flying at the moment. Uh, you have the Seattle Sounders reportedly eyeing Real Zaragoza holding midfielder Inigo Iguaras. Uh, this is coming from El Periodico in Spain. Could be a target when the international transfer window opens up next month. Could have other MLS teams. Looking for Inigo Iguaras as well, uh, according to El Periodico, but they're not naming other teams. Seattle's the only team that they specifically name. If this is a valid possibility, what this makes me think is that the Sounders are planning on dropping Gustav Svensson to the back line and 
playing Iguaras as the number six. Because right now, when you look at the Seattle roster, defensively, e- <laughs> here's what you have defensively right now as defenders, right. and this is not including Svensson. You have Kelvin Leardam, who was a starter. You have Nuhu Tolo, who is crazy. Yes. And sometimes starter. Not much. And you have Xavier Ariaga, who signed midseason. That's it. That's all. That's the only defenders you have. You have Gustav Svensson, who has played mostly in the holding midfield, but has played in the back. Uh, you don't have any defenders. So if you're <laughs> and one of them's for crazy. Six, yes, yes. Nuhu is is not someone you normally count on on the defensive side of things. You you let him be Nuhu. So if you're adding, if you're looking to add a six, I think it's got to be to drop Svensson to the back line. I just don't see any other way that works. And if you're starting Svensson and Ariaga as your two center backs, okay, that's not too bad. We will see what happens with Seattle, but I was a little surprised until I started doing the math. I'm like, it's got to mean they're going to move Svensson into the back. Uh, Medio Tiempo follows through on two day NA's post, uh, linking Alan Pulido from Chivas, joint Golden Boot winner in Liga MX this season, to San Jose. But Medio Tiempo adds Orlando City into that mix as a potential suitor for Pulido. $10 $10 million is the number that has been thrown around when it comes to Polito. Now, now Chivas is saying, hey, we're happy. We want to keep him. You know, If Polito wants to force a move, I, I think he probably can. And when you're talking eight figures, it's going to be hard for Chivas to say no. Didn't expect to hear Orlando City's name mentioned in this one. No, but when you're mentioning Orlando City, yeah, obviously for me, I'm still trying to figure out the touchline. Anything new on Pareja? Nothing new, and I'm curious to see what that ends up looking like because, you know, Twelman's little throw-in about other teams or another team who is interested, does that mean that the deal with Pereja is not done for Orlando? Does it mean that he was basically like, look, I don't even want to talk until I'm done here in, in Tijuana? If it's open, if it's an open season for Oscar Pereja, you've got a lot of teams that should be lining up to speak to him. And Real Salt Lake, for me, is the one that, that steps to the front of the line because they are a very similar type of situation to what Pereja thrived in in Dallas. Now, you do have the questions about the the ownership involvement. You do have the questions about a general manager. But if, if you're going to bring Preha in and, and let him run it, do you give him that kind of say after what he did in Dallas? Maybe. Or do you give him the opportunity to, to pick who he wants to work with? Probably. I think RSL would be the perfect fit for what we've seen Pereja do in his career. I think Orlando could be as well, and the the partnership with him and Luis Muzi makes a ton of sense because of their past history together. But Orlando's going to be a harder road for Pereja to have success. RSL, you have an academy that's producing already. You're going to have young players to incorporate already. Orlando, you're going to have to build a lot of that or rebuild or start from scratch in some cases or change the culture probably predominantly. That's a different kind of job. And if RSL gets into the mix on Pereja, that'd be hard for him to turn down in my opinion. Because I was going to ask from what we've seen about Pereja, especially going back to his time in Dallas, would you perceive him as a builder or would you want him or or do you think that he would hop into something like rsl because of the readiness factor so i guess my question is readiness versus building well he'll do he'll do either one i mean he he built in dallas he built in colorado and 
you know, then he came into Dallas when he took the first team job in a different spot. He built the academy, went to Colorado and took the first team, but also put a lot of good things in place from their academy that it's now starting to bear fruit. Then he went to Dallas and, you know, took advantage of what he had built previously with the academy and played it out at the first team level and won a supporter shield. He can do both. I don't think it's an either or. I think for Pereja, the best fit is a club like a Dallas, like an RSL, as opposed to a a New York City, for example. You know, I I think he wants to be in a spot where he'll have the ability and the comfort level to play young players. New York City, they do, and they've created that culture of doing it last season with Sands. But we also know the expectation of a New York City about win, win, win. That's a tougher fit. I think he's capable of it. But I think he's most comfortable in a situation like RSL where playing young players, developing young players, moving them along, that's what suits him the best. And he doesn't need... And and maybe, you know, some managers are better without the mega superstars. I don't think Pereja needs them to be successful in this league. 2016, not that long ago, he won a supporter shield in Dallas. I think he could do the same in RSL. I think he could in Orlando, too. I just think it's a, a longer road to that. I think you walk into RSL, a team that was number three in the West last year, and if you bring Pereja to the table, they're a contender in the Western Conference next year. And then that was why I asked. I was just trying to figure out the the options laying them out on the table and making the case for each one when it comes to the the chase for Oscar Pereja the miniseries. Yes, yeah, I, I think it could be a miniseries. I think the telenovela could be quite entertaining with this one because if I'm RSL and it's sounding like it's not a guarantee he ends up in Orlando, then I am on the phone and I am finding everybody possible to get it get a contact into Pereja. I think he could be the perfect fit for them. What else is in the rumor mill that uh, struck you in the overnight heading into this morning? Well, still in Orlando, Christian Higuita said his goodbyes uh, to fans yesterday. He's the last player from that 2015 original group that was with the team. He's out of contract. Sounds like Orlando wasn't interested in bringing him back. Um, he's headed back to Columbia. I guess there's still interest potentially in the league for him to sign a new deal, but there had been rumors previously about him signing in Columbia. Nothing's happened as of yet, so stay tuned there. I think he's a player who can play in MLS. I think he was a player who was, you know, was was solid for Orlando on some bad teams. So I'm a little surprised there hasn't been an interest in him, and and maybe that will materialize, but. Maybe he ends up playing in, in Colombia as well. Uh, we mentioned Dominic Baji. The other, when you start digging into the Instagram posts, the other one that grabbed people's attention yesterday was Sebastian Legette hanging out with Juan Agadello and kind of hinting at finally they're going to get to play together. Well, that would mean Agadello would be going to the LA Galaxy. They do need a number nine. Um, they are going to have some limitations based off designated player rules and what they can do with a number nine. Agadello is a ridiculously talented player who I don't think has ever truly lived up to his potential. Could he do that in an LA Galaxy team with players like Christian Pavone, Roman Alessandrini, Jonathan Dos Santos setting him up? Well, if he can't do it there, I don't think he's going to do it. So could Agadello be going to the Galaxy and hanging out with Legette? makes some sense yeah that that's I'm, I'm still trying i'm trying to find his salary figure 605 is what it was last year okay so uh could we see more creative bookkeeping with the galaxy or do you think this one would fit and you there's buy no, him down no, there's no creative yeah you, you buy him down there's no creative bookmaking needed like you just buy him down I mean, you're not gonna, right. you know, he's not gonna be a designated player because you don't have the spot, and he doesn't have to be. You're talking about buying him down of about fifty thousand dollars. You no, can handle no. that. That's easy. The number's five thirty. Yes. That's six oh five is not much more than that. So you can handle that. That's an yep. easy one. That's an easy fit. You've got plenty of room for Tam guys. So that would make sense. It would make a lot of sense. It'd be a little bit of a risk, 
you'd be asking Agadello to to live up to the potential that he's had, and I, I I think he can do it. I think it's a good fit for him, but we'll have to see if that's the move the Galaxy end up making. Uh, something we haven't talked about as of yet on the NWSL side, Olympic Lyon, uh, their parent company, OL Group, is that's the investment firm that their owner uh, Alas owns. He's the majority owner of that. They are in exclusive talks to buy Rain FC in the NWSL from their majority owners, Teresa and Bill Predmore. They've operated the team since the launch of the NWSL. They brought on some minority owners last year. This move would have those minority owners bought out, and OL would be the majority owners. The Predmores would remain as minority owners. Predmore would be the CEO, or Bill Predmore would be the CEO. Teresa Predmore would be the president of the Rain Academy. If you're wondering about Leon's money to work with, in 2018-19, they reported record revenues of more than $340 million. I think they're good. And we know what Lyon has done on the, the, the women's side professionally overseas. And so to, to have them, A, gauge interest in wanting to be a part of the NWSL, and B, what we're expecting to happen with OL Group and the NWSL – I mean, it's a, another step where the NWSL is sitting there and attracting more sets of eyes and attracting uh, owners who are looking to, you know, perhaps invest and, and keep players that you wouldn't otherwise be able to keep one way or the other. So, if this does go down in January, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what OL Group does when it comes to growing the product and salaries and on all that kind of stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing the next stages here. If this does come to pass in January. Yeah. The question would be, does rain become a support team for Leon or do they just become two independent teams that are at the same ownership or does Leon support rain? I don't know. Uh, I'll be curious to see. I mean, y you would think right now, and, and this is what is so hard on the women's game. Is the French League better than the NWSL? I don't think so. Not as a whole. But is Lyon better than anybody in the NWSL? Maybe. And Lyon and North Carolina Courage have been neck and neck. You know, they've been right there together as two of the top teams in the world at the club level. Reigns are not quite to that point. But not that far off. So how is it? You know, how does it kind of manage? That's the question that I think a lot of people would have. Is it just going to be a feeder team? I don't think so, but I'm, I'm curious to see how that gets managed. We'll have to wait and see. U.S. Soccer announced their Player of the Year nominees for 2019 on the men's and the women's side. On the women's side, the nominees are Megan Rapino, Alyssa Nair, Alex Morgan, Carly Lloyd, Rose Lavelle, Julie Ertz. On the men's side, Aaron Long, Weston McKinney, Tim Ream, Christian Pulisic, Jordan Morris, Jossie Zardis. And I'm sure people threw things when they saw Zardis' name on here. Yeah. Stop doing it. Zardis was, had a good year in U.S. soccer this year, both at the club level and with the national team. On the men's side, Jordan Morris gets my vote. Yeah. Morris was outstanding for Seattle, outstanding with the national team. I think he is the, the vote there. And on the women's side, I think Rapino will win it. But I think Julie Ertz should win it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I was leaning. I was uh, My vote was going to go to Ertz. But with you know with what we saw with Megan Rapino, I think that, yes, yeah, she will win it. But Ertz would have gotten my vote. And I was going to vote for Jordan Morris as well. Yeah, I, I think Rapino being such a big public figure of this last World Cup will we'll get it for her. But I thought the player that the U.S. could least do without in the World Cup was Ertz. I, I thought Ertz was the most important one. And Lavelle might be next for me on that. Yeah, But Ertz, it, it's the, the holding midfielders appreciation society coming out in me. I mean, it's that position doesn't get as much love and... I think Ertz was the most important player, even though she's not scoring all the goals and not getting all the headlines. I don't think you win the World Cup without Julie Ertz. No. No, I'm right there with you and all those. Yes, check, check, and check from me. 
All right, we're going to take a break, get into the Twitter timeline right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Wall Pass Wednesday. That means we take your questions, your topics, your comments on Twitter and bring them to the floor. What do we have so far? All right. Would you want uh, what folks are thankful for? Do you want the the soccer question that came across our bow or the Thanksgiving specific question that came across our bow? Let's work soccer question first. AUFC Debo. Thoughts on hashtag Super Mario coming to MLS and where he would fit in best? My guess is L.A. or Miami. Okay, we're not talking about the uh, Mario Brothers video game, I'm assuming. I'm going to assume we're talking about Mr. Balotelli. Correct, yes. I don't think uh, the plumber Mario had much of a vertical leap to uh, win a lot of headers. so Got over got, o- those... got over the barrels when he needed to. Yeah, but he had to get like the power-ups and stuff. They don't have those in the in real life. So, Balotelli coming to MLS. Where would he fit? Toronto's been linked to him, and I, I don't know how he fits there unless they're going to play two up top on a regular basis. And then he has to build a relationship with Altidore, which is, is very possible, uh, but I don't know about that one. Um... On the field, Kansas City, they need a number nine. Don't know if he would fit with Peter Vermes. LA Galaxy need a number nine, and I think he he could fit very nicely with Guillermo Barros Escaloto, but they're going to need to clear a designated player spot. And if that means they move on from Roman Alessandrini or they're able to do a new deal with him to get him under the designated player threshold because he's very close, okay, that's that's a really good landing spot, and it's one that, I could see him really fitting in well with uh, Miami and and Nashville are both obvious because their expansion. Nashville has a bunch of different forward options, so I don't know if they would want to take that on, and I don't know if they would want to put up the type of money we're talking about here. Miami could. He would give Miami all the sizzle that they're probably looking for. Uh, you'd have to make the decision on you know you've invested in Julian Carranza from Bonfield at nineteen. Is he going to play up top, or are you going to move him out wide? Um, could you play a situation where you have Carranza on one side, uh, Pellegrini, your youngster coming over from Estudiantes, on the other side, two 19-year-old wingers with Lee Wynn in the middle and Mario Balotelli up top? Maybe. That could work. That's not a bad idea. Wonder who's going to be the manager making those decisions, because that hasn't been named yet. 
And now, as we follow through on Miami, you have Felipe Cardenas following through on some reports out of Argentina. It's sounding like Marcelo Gallardo is going to stick around a little bit with River, at least for a little while, because they've got a couple things coming up. So they have the Copa Argentina final on December 13th. They win that. That gets you into the Libertadores group stage. Gajardo also has not won a Superliga title. The Superliga will run through beginning of March, I think. Um, The season, it's strange. It's definitely a different kind of setup than, than you're accustomed to. It's 24 teams in the league. They play 23 matches in the normal Super League season. There's about 10 or so left for each team. And that's your, your season. There's no playoffs or anything. So right now, River is in fifth place, but they are four points back of Boca Juniors and Argentinos Juniors, and they have a game in hand, so they're right there. Uh, that game in hand, they play it... I thought they played it in early December before that Copa Argentina final. I might be mistaken on that. So that'll be... They'll play their 14th game in the league this season, or this weekend. So that means they'd have nine games left in the regular season. You have that final. You have a summer break coming up. They'll start back in uh, late January with the season. Could you see a situation where Gajardo decides, you know what, I'm I'm not going to go to MLS. I've got all these different possibilities in Europe and more that could be springing up by the day. I will try to win a Super League season. I will try to get River into the group stage of Copa Libertadores. And then I will bow out before the, the Copa de la Superliga, which is like a mini league that actually counts for relegation and promotion because welcome to Argentina. It's crazy. There's a test on this later. But I think he could bow out then, take a break, and sit and wait and see what happens in Europe because the level of buzz he is getting has maybe went beyond what Miami could match. Now, the question then is Miami's been very consistent here recently in saying, we got our guy, we're going to announce him soon. If it wasn't Gajardo all along, who is it? Because I don't know who would make the most sense for it to be in that situation that you haven't announced already. And if it was, and now things have changed... How do you spin this and make mm-hmm. it work? And that's the question. Now, you cannot at this point jump to any conclusion that it has been Gajardo all along. There, there's nothing to definitively say, oh, yeah, that's what it was, and now they got to scramble. No, there, you don't know. Like It definitely made sense when you connected all the dots, but there was no guarantee that that was it. I just don't know who else would fit into that equation of somebody that they couldn't have announced by now. I don't know. I'm um, not sure. You, you, I, I saw some things bouncing around. I don't know if they were pulling out old rumors or not. Uh, mentioning Santiago Solari again. And I think he'd be a great hire. I just, If he's the guy, I don't know why he wasn't announced previously. So... I have to wait and see on Miami, but that could factor in a little bit. When you're talking about a player like a Balotelli, you know, you're you're getting into a level of does your manager want to deal with that? Can they deal with that? Because that's not just your typical player coming in and they're just gonna be part of the squad. Balotelli needs some additional management. We've seen it so many times in his career. You need the right manager to get the best out of him. And could that be a Solari? Yeah, I think so. I think it could be. Could it be a Gajardo? Yes, I think it could be. But not every manager wants to deal with that. Right. So I have to wait and see. All right, on the table, and I guess we can go with the the soccer for good OGs question because it can carry us also through the remainder of the show today. Okay. 
She says it can't be a hashtag wall pass Wednesday before Thanksgiving without bad, meh, or interesting food takes. What's the non-traditional dish that sits on your table? Mine is green and shrimp salad. Hashtag thankful for soccer. I, I know. Uh, hashtag thankful for Atlanta United. Thankful for hashtag thankful for SDH. Hashtag thankful for everything. I've never heard of green and shrimp salad. I yeah, I've never thought of shrimp on Thanksgiving. Um, I don't really get weird with it. Like, there's nothing that is just strange on a, a Thanksgiving table for me. It's pretty traditional. I mean, I'm gonna go and grab the. I, I guess some will go back and forth on mac and cheese on Thanksgiving. I'll eat mac and cheese any day of the week, yeah, so that's going to be there for me. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go grab some sweet potatoes. I'm going to go grab you know some kind of a casserole. Uh, I do prefer ham more than turkey, although I'll have a yeah. little bit of turkey too. I'm going to probably get more of the ham. Um, I don't. Yeah, but I've got to have the too gravy weird with it, honestly. For me, I guess one's a dessert, and it would be the lemon meringue pie or the key lime that's put on the table. Yeah, it does, it's not as Thanksgiving-y, but it's not like crazy different, though, because okay. I think with desserts, you can. I think desserts are far more open to experimentation on Thanksgiving than the regular meal. And then with the boss and going to her family's Thanksgiving and it's a, it's a to do. And so we hop in the car and we go to Montgomery, which is like a center point for all of her family coming from South Alabama and us coming over and all that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a dish that is a family recipe and it is a rice dish where it is uh, white rice and beef consomme. And okay. it turns it turns the rice basically brown, and it's got a very very, uh, very very thick texture to it. It's very very good. It's named obviously after her grandmother, so it's her grandmother's rice dish. But it's basically a boatload of beef consomme with white rice, and it's very solid. So I guess that would be non traditional because it's a family edition. Well, it's not so much that it's a family edition, but it's just not a a normal selection that would end up on a Thanksgiving table. So, so that would, I guess that would be the one for me and, and uh, it is, it's solid. I'll, I'll, uh, at some point I'll make sure that there's some extra and that, uh, you can, you can sample it, but you have to get it past me. And that's a very rare thing since I will pretty much sit down and have it for an entire meal. I'm pretty quick. I might be able to pull it off. All right. So that would be non-traditional for me with, whether it's the dessert or the the family rice dish. Okay. Um, throw yours in the mix on Twitter at soccer down here. We'll get to more of those in hour number two. We'll get into the question of the day about what you are thankful for in the world of soccer, whether it's Atlanta United related or not. Um, one other bit of news that has popped up that some people are trying to connect the dots on, and they might be right here. The City Football Group announced a $500 million strategic investment by a U.S.-based company, Silver Lake. It's a tech investment giant company. So, one, the the deal values City Football Group as a whole at $4.8 billion. Kind of large. Um, This takes the board of City Football Group holding company from eight members to nine. This is where um, Khaldun Albark has indicated that the proceeds from the investment will be used by City Football Group to fund international business growth opportunities and develop further CFG technology and infrastructure assets. Some are speculating that this is coming in to help fund a stadium in yeah. New York. Hmm. I get the logic of, of that assumption. Yeah. It's very possible. So stay tuned on New York. You know, the what we talked about with the location and some of the neighborhood meetings that have been going on and some of the things that have been pretty quiet in building blocks to a potential stadium. 
maybe it's actually coming to fruition and maybe this is another building block in that process. $500 million coming into the kitty to, to build a stadium in New York City? Not bad. But yeah, that was the first thing that honestly popped into my head when you were talking about the uh, the capital investment was money toward a stadium. That was the first thing literally that popped into my head. Could be. We will see how it plays out. We'll keep you posted on more breaking there. We'll keep you posted on any other moves around the league. There's a couple uh, soccer discussion points we'll get into in hour number two as well. The Athletic has posted their moments of the 2010s in U.S. soccer and their worst designated player signings in MLS in the 2010s. And we'll get into both of those along with what you're thankful for as we prepare for Thanksgiving tomorrow. Hang out with us. We'll be right back after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two, SDH, November 27th. Getting ready for Thanksgiving. That always brings you around to what you are thankful for in the last year, just in general. And for us, what are you thankful for in your soccer world? Is it something Atlanta United related? Is it something about the kids playing? Is it something about, you know, getting together with friends to watch games? What is it that you are thankful for in your soccer world? That was the Wall Pass Wednesday question of the day. What do we have so far on the Twitters, John? Daniel Price. I'm thankful for soccer in Atlanta United because it gave me another way to connect to my dad, my brother, and my best friend. I was never the sports guy like some of my friends and family, but with soccer, I can use it to connect and have something to talk about. I'm also thankful for all the new friends and amazing people I've met along the way. Soccer's introduced me to a whole new family that I'd never know I would have. I've created so many memories that I will cherish for the rest of my life, and I can't wait to make more. Yeah, that's one very cool thing about this as opposed to, I think, other sports. Um, although you do get elements of it, I, I think especially in college um, and, and college football specifically here in the South, and maybe just because we see it the most up close where you know people get together and, and tailgate 
for every game, and it's the same group that you've gotten together with for a long time. Maybe you don't have as much of that, like with the Hawks or with the Braves. You do to a degree with the Falcons, and I think it's a little bit of that carryover of, of the tailgating culture. Well, the supporter group culture is that. And just the supporters culture of soccer, whether you're in a, one of the, the large supporters groups or a local group of people who get together and watch the away games at the same place every time. Like, it's very communal and more so than any other sport. And I don't know if it's just that's the way it's developed both here and abroad or if it's just something about soccer specifically that lends itself to it. But it creates community better than any other sport that I can think of. Shiva. She goes, great question. Thankful for Atlanta United for providing a joyful event to attend with my son. Thankful for at long shoot for educating me about soccer. Thankful for at soccer down here for keeping me busy and entertained in the mornings and thankful for at Mike Conti 929 for the passion and energy he brings to game days. Thanks for listening to Shiva. We appreciate it. And it's, it's a lot of fun to do what we do and, and get a chance to, to talk about the game. I mean, you know what, what Daniel said, what Shiva said, like it is something that brings people together and doing this, you know, brings people together in some different kind of way maybe not all in the same room except when we do special events but at least together on social media and being connected in different ways like one of the the cool things i've I've heard about multiple times here lately is people who listen to the show not that knew each other previously but listen to the show now interact and have now met each other and 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 different things that have happened because of this show which is very very cool would have never guessed that would have happened and that to me you know when when we're when we go out and whether it's at uh, brew house or whether we're with the faction and we get to to meet everybody and then we sit there and we see how the folks have used us almost as the the spoke and the wheel where they get to meet other people and they get to, to have conversations with them as well. So, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a part of the coolness factor for me along a very long line of coolness factor that we have with this. Yes. Chris Hutchison for Atlanta United. He's thankful for, for showing the United States that we have world-class fans in the U S hungry for world-class U S soccer. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it for me is that, you know, now Atlanta is just on the map of soccer around the world. And and I think that's been reinforced for me with the whole Aberdeen relationship and the reaction to it. it. It Five years ago, I would have never guessed that if an Atlanta soccer team invested in a club, you know, with 100 plus years of history like Aberdeen, that people would be receiving that warmly. But that's what's happening right now because of what has been built with Atlanta United and and the culture around it. It's changed so fast because of how well things have been done here. It's very, very cool to see because I would have never guessed it. If you had told me that part five years ago, I mean, people always ask, like, you know, did you ever believe that it would be like this? And I, I tell them honestly, like, I do, but I thought it would take time. Yeah. I would have never guessed some of this type of stuff that it would go beyond just, okay, it's big. You have a huge crowd. You have a huge crowd on a regular basis. You have a good team. It's gone to, you have one of the biggest clubs in the world in value in attendance. And to the point that when they go to a place like Scotland and a club like Aberdeen, that started in 1903 and invest people are asking the reverse of what they would have asked every time before this deal was announced people instead of saying well we know what you know we we know what the established team the older team is going to give to the new team 
But what is, you know, what is it going to be the other way? Here, it's people are like, well, we know what Aberdeen's getting out of it. They're getting money. They're, they're getting the support on building a new stadium and, and the fan experience. All that. We, we understand what Atlanta is providing to Aberdeen. But what is Atlanta going to get out of it? That's what people are asking, which is, is wild to me that something this strong and this impactful has been built this quickly. No, and I mean, for me, it's another big freaking deal and a bunch of big freaking deals that have happened in a very short period of time. You've had uh, a sale of Miguel Almiron. You've brought in Ezekiel Barco. You've brought in P.T. Martinez. You now have this relationship with Aberdeen. You've had over 50,000 people on average coming to your matches in your stadium. You've won an MLS Cup. You've made it into CONCACAF Champions League. You've won an Open Cup. You've won Campeones Cup. All of these big freaking deals, and they keep being added. And the fact that it's happening right here in front of us on a, on a daily basis. I mean, it's all of this stuff happening so quickly. I mean, it's 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 a snowball effect kind of really. I mean, I was trying to figure out just how it's the best way to to phrase what has happened, but it's a lot of big freaking deals in a bunch of different categories in a very short period of time. But honestly, in the big picture of it, the big freaking deals are not the trophies. The big freaking deals are the impact. Mm-hmm. That's what's the big freaking deal here. The trophies are great, but there have been teams in this league and in this country that have won trophies. It's the fact that Atlanta has changed the story of what American soccer is and what MLS is and what it can be. That's the big freaking deal. And that's the part that I didn't expect. Not any time that I would have been able to see it. That's what's been wild about this. Um, bit of news that, that's popped up out of Kansas City. And, and this is very interesting. Sporting Kansas City is a club that hasn't been a major spender in the league hasn't been a you know a bottom end team in investment but hasn't been a major team in investment uh at a i, I guess a, a media availability yesterday peter verme said i can tell you this we're definitely getting a player on each of the lines so a defender midfielder forward and the the quote from their board of owners is that they are ready to make quote, an injection of capital into the club. So now this has been a question mark across the board about what's going to happen when you have your Atlantas come in and spend big money. You have your LAFCs come in and spend big money. Toronto has already been spending big money. New York City has spent big money. Teams are spending more money. Miami is going to come in and spend money. Our some ownerships going to step up and spend more money with the idea that, hey, we can make more money if we spend more money. And it's something that, that Verme went on to say, I just think that with the injection of capital, it's opened us up to a whole other one, two, three different tiers that we can look at that maybe in the past we couldn't. Uh, Mike Illig is one of the principal owners of Sporting Kansas City. He said, it's a level we have not played in, but it doesn't scare us. We're not going to go make stupid decisions and pay our way out of it. We're going to be smart about it. But I don't think it's a question of whether we're willing. I'm telling you, yes, we're willing. And the number nine is, is the, the forward is something that they've been lacking since they traded Dom Dwyer. That is something that we are going to see in Kansas City. And if they're going to spend more, that opens up some doors. And Lucas Cavallini has been one that has been mentioned. This is a guy who has scored goals in Liga MX. A guy who's going to cost you six, seven million dollars on a transfer fee. Are you talking about that type of investment? Six, seven million is, is not anything to to, you know, kind of laugh at. That's a that's a significant investment in bringing a guy in. You're going to have to pay the salary then to go along with it. But are we talking maybe even something bigger than that? Be curious to see what Kansas City does. But this is good to see. I mean, you don't have to just throw money around, as Illig says. Like It's not just about money fixes it. you still got to be smart with it. And I don't think Kansas City is going to outspend Toronto, Atlanta, L.A., but putting more money into the mix should give them 
a better product on the field, and they've been really good, would that be enough, along with their strong academy program, along with a manager like Peter Vermes, is that going to be enough to keep them at the top of the Western Conference going forward? I think it could. Yeah, it's about spending. It's not just about spending money, but spending money wisely, spending within your means and understanding what you have, resources on hand, and in Sporting's case for me, that means Swope Park Academy, things like that, and then building from there. And then hearing this statement from Illig about investment, I mean, that for me, okay, so then what is that level of investment? And I know that your Peter Vermes is mentioning, okay, bringing in guys on each line. All right, so what does that mean? If it's Cavallini? then that means Cavallini. But if it means more than that, then for me, I just I want to see what uh, the end results are. I I, th- I think you're 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 sounding more skeptical than, in my opinion, this deserves because Kansas City's had a track record of success. This is not Chicago. This is not Houston. Even this is not a lot of teams in this league. This is Kansas City that has won Open Cups, has won MLS Cup has been at near the top of the league, I mean, as recently as 2018, Western Conference finalists. With that base and putting more money into it, I I don't think there's a lot of reason to be skeptical. Now, you make a bad signing, you make a bad signing. That's a different conversation altogether. But you add some more resources to this, and and you're going to see situations like Vermees talks about at the end of the article in the Kansas City Star. You know, he talked about, players who they they've lost in this offseason and Seth Sinovic is one of them and a guy who's been there for nine years Vermi said I've said this to Seth many times not just this year but he's probably the most team orientated guy that I've ever been around he wore the club emblem on his heart that guy so I have nothing but the utmost respect for him and everything that he did here and it's just hard he said this if you want change Some people are going to have to be moved down for change. It's part of my job to try and make those decisions. If you want to make upgrades, that means some of the players who are in spots now have to take a step back or go. That's that's upgrading. That's 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 the nature of it. It's very difficult to make those decisions. And this is a guy who's nine years. I mean, he won MLS Cup there. It's a guy who's been a, a stalwart of that club. But if you're going to upgrade, that means somebody's got to go. Yeah. And it's difficult. And and that's where you're at with a sporting Kansas City. If you're going to put more money into it, that means you've got to upgrade on the back line, in the midfield, and you've got to get that number nine that you've been searching for that you haven't been able to hit on. You're going to have more resources to do it. It doesn't necessarily fix it, but it gives you more to work with and gives you, I think, more potential to fix it. More folks have uh, been on the timeline about what they're thankful for. Michael Bucklew, and I think that he's uh, definitely in the majority. He's thankful for a roof over where my team plays. <laughs> it's funny that that's become a very nice thing here in Atlanta because there were people who were not happy about that at first, and there were people who made a lot of snide comments about it, and then there were a lot of people who were like, open the roof, open the roof, open the roof. And it's open. It's like, no, close the roof. <laughs> close the roof. Close the roof. Yeah. Close it. And then the, the record with Atlanta United with the roof closed versus uh, worth, with, versus when the roof is open as well. Yeah, I'm not going to put anything. <laughs> I don't think it changes anything like that. That's silliness. I, I love the stadium when the roof is open. I feel so different. Um, I love it. But, yeah, it with the... A 90 degree day, and when Atlanta gets these, you know, national TV games at four or five o'clock on a Sunday in the summer, and it's 95 degrees, and it feels like close the roof. Closed roof. It's nice. It, it's nice to have to plan on. Man, they keep this broadcast booth so freaking cold. I need a jacket, and it's July. Yes. Dress for where you're going, not for where you are. Michael Ruiz, outside of what we're thankful for with the discussion that we were having with Kansas City, he says, when do we start seeing MLS clubs start to spend on defenders? I feel with all the attacking talent being spent on in the past three to four years, the pendulum will have to swing back towards defense eventually. I'm thinking Atlanta United will lead that charge soon. 
Yeah, totally agree. Uh, I I do think it it could be Atlanta United that does it first because they're not looking at it in the old school way of all right, we have to sign this guy to sell shirts, we have to sign this guy to score goals and and get headlines. Atlanta's like we have to sign this guy to win trophies. So part of winning trophies is having a strong defense, and Atlanta's been able to have a strong defense because. I remember writing this at Dirty South Soccer ahead of the 2017 season. They invested more defensively than any team had in its expansion season coming in. You compare the back line year one with Atlanta to year one of NYC, year one of Orlando, year one of the reconstituted earthquakes, year one of Portland, Vancouver, Montreal even Seattle, what Atlanta did year one with a back line that started with Parkhurst, LGP in the middle, who you didn't really know what LGP was going to turn into, and he turned into something pretty special. Greg Garza, who you hoped would stay healthy, and when he was special. And Tyrone Mears on the right side, who got supplanted as the year went on by Anton Walks, which nobody expected. Anton walks to, to come in and give you the performances he did, but he was very good in the second half of that season. And then you got even better going into 2018 when you added Franco Escobar into the mix. And now you've had the development of Miles Robinson. So you've had a top defense in Atlanta, honestly, from the very beginning. And don't forget about Brad Kazan and the effect he's had on the back line. So you've had that. You've invested do you get to a time where you want to invest even more? Potentially. It, it could happen. I, I don't think you really have to with the group you have right now. I think you have one of the best defenses in the league. The other thing is, and I think maybe it's just some bad luck, you, you look at what New England did, for example, with going out and, and getting Michael Mancy in and investing heavily in him, and it did not pay off at all. He's had some injuries, but he also the performances have not been what he was worth now, when it was announced that he had signed a renegotiated deal, I wondered what that was going to mean because he was on a pretty high number. It uh, uh, reportedly, and we'll see when the numbers come out next spring, it looks like he took about a 50% pay cut to come back and, and play with the Revolution because according to reports in the New England media, he will not need TAM. So he's going from one of the highest paid defenders in the league to under $530,000 a year. I think the reports are around 400000 a year for him for another year on his deal. That They invested, but they invested incorrectly and had some bad luck with injuries too, which you can never factor in. You look at, at Jorgen Skelvik at the LA Galaxy. They've invested in him, but has he been worth it? Not really. Not to the degree that they've paid. So, going back to the big picture with Kansas City, investing is part of the equation, but the scouting and the identification is the most important part. Because if you don't have as much money to invest, if you scout well, if you identify talent well, and then you develop it when you have it, you can make up that gap. If you have money, but then don't identify the right player to use it on, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And that's what it, that's the combination that it's going to take. And I think Atlanta has been able to manage both sides of that really, really well. They've had the money to go out and invest, but they've done it in a very smart way so far. So you got to have that. You got to have your right identification group and you've got to have your right, you know, people out there making those decisions on, all right, we're going to spend more defensively than we have in the past. Here's who we're going to go get and why, because they're going to fit. That's the part that maybe even before the investment kicking up another notch defensively, that part has to be fixed or you're just throwing the money away. Speaking of money, Tafka says he can't help but hope for a money ball type of movie with Atlanta United in 30 years, the club that changed the league type thing. I'd be pretty cool. I'd be down with that. Um, so then who's, who's Darren? Pl- yeah, I was about to say, who's Darren? Who's Carlos? Uh, who's Tata? These types of things are going to be pretty funny to see. So, yeah, I'd be down for it. Um, 
I'm I'm kind of glad in a lot of ways because of just the soap opera nature of it that you have not had like an Amazon Prime series or a you know uh, any of those kinds of things on on Atlanta United. Although this one on Tottenham, if you oh. haven't seen some of the reports that keep coming out about this, so we mentioned it that the next Amazon Prime series on Tottenham uh, is going to be about this season. That was announced before the season started. It's like, oh, wow, there's going to be a lot of things to talk about. Well, that's kicked up a few notches. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reportedly, the Amazon Prime cameras were on hand when Pochettino was let go and were on hand for Jose Mourinho's first day at the club. (laughs) Mourinho said yesterday when he was asked about what he said to the team at halftime uh, before their their big turnaround. And he's like, oh, you have to wait for the Amazon Prime movie. Like, oh, my God. This thing is going to be ridiculous. <laughs> uh, the Colonel's chimed in this morning. Morning, Colonel. Uh, what's up, Colonel? Will the new chairman at Aberdeen FC maintain his residence slash season tickets here or move permanently to Scotland? Will Darren buy season tickets at Pitodri? Thankful for your response. Hashtag well past Wednesday. I would assume, and I don't know the the process. I would assume that that Darren would have a a season ticket at Aberdeen. Um, I think, from what I've read, I, I think uh, Cormac will will keep his residence in Atlanta. I don't know if he's gonna move the family back because of the role. I think he'll he'll be back and forth, and he can do a lot of things from here. So, I think this relationship is only going to continue to grow. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about it and I want to see two, two clubs that are in different positions, although they do have a lot in common. I want to see how they can benefit one another. You know, can, can this investment and this relationship lift Aberdeen into a spot where they can compete with Celtic and Rangers? Rangers might, eliminate themselves if they keep running their club in the way that they have. But can you bridge that gap? Because you're not going to be able to spend as much as as Celtic because you don't have that kind of revenue. But like we were just talking about, can you make smart signings? Can you get the right value out of things? Can you bridge that gap with intelligence with Celtic and and compete for a a Scottish league title and, and cup titles and such? And can you get into Europe on a regular basis? And then what does Atlanta United get out of it? You know, can can this help Atlanta United young players develop? Can Atlanta United youth players go over and spend time in Aberdeen's academy? Can they go over and spend time on loan? Does Aberdeen young talent come over and, and come on loan to Atlanta to the twos and, and get time in the USL championship in a different environment? Sometimes that change of environment can unlock things in a player, so... I think it's going to be a truly beneficial relationship both ways. And I do think that uh, both members that are, and I think Cormac was on the board before, but Darren will have tickets at Aberdeen and you will see him in Aberdeen and you will see Cormac in Atlanta with his season tickets here. I think you'll see both. And now we just have to work on getting the trip sponsored where SDH is uh, on site doing stuff at Aberdeen. It's very, very possible, and and you know I think you will see Atlanta fans going over and, and seeing Aberdeen, and I, I no know doubt. this summer you're going to see some groups of Aberdeen fans coming over to Atlanta, and that's going to be very cool, and hopefully we can do something with that when uh, there's an organized group that comes over to an Atlanta United match. So I'm excited about all these different possibilities. I think it's going to be a lot of fun building this relationship out. Let's take a quick break. Join the conversation on Twitter at Soccer Down here with what you are thankful for, craziest things on your Thanksgiving table, anything else on your mind on a Wednesday. We'll be right back after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update! I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. 
Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here, November 27th, Wall Pass Wednesday on the final show of the week. We will not be with you tomorrow on Thanksgiving or on Friday. We will have some special editions coming up, though, some special 1v1s. Later today, you will get to hear Derek Ray's thoughts on the Aberdeen-Atlanta United relationship You'll also get to hear from Jason at Home Sweet Soccer about USL League One. Um, Lots of things that will be coming up, and if there's any breaking news or anything that happens in the American soccer world, we'll we'll drop a uh, 1v1 or Hot Dropper special edition for you over the break. We'll also have some form of a soccer over there crumpets and espresso what have you getting ready for a big weekend around europe and the rest of the world in soccer uh champions league today don't know if we'll get the drama that we did with with spurs yesterday don't know if we'll get a ball boy with an assist like we did with spurs yesterday that was that was great and uh Mourinho's comments were were very funny about that one of course he had to talk about how excellent of a ball boy that he was when he was a ball boy back yes Because, you know, that's Jose. Yes, and you had Olympiacos fans going full Zapruder and saying that it was an illegal throw. Oh, stop. Jeez. Yes. Saw that? No, 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 no. Not the case. So, all right. Um, what else do we have on the Twitter timeline, John? Eliana. I'm thankful to Atlanta United for bringing my family together, for all the joy and excitement, and for every unforgettable memory made. I'm thankful to Atlanta United for bringing the enjoyment and the beauty of the sport back into my life. Yeah, that's the that's the thing about the game is, you know, you, you think back to all the different memories of being in the stands, being, you know, at a watch party, whatever it is, but, you know, that's that's the sport. And uh, I think it's just the special nature of of this sport that provides all of that. And I was watching a little bit of a, a great series on Amazon Prime about, I think it was called Football Shrines. And they the one that I saw was about Old Trafford. And you had like fans of three different generations that were hanging out and talking about their experiences at the stadium and, and following the club and it was very cool to hear like three completely different generations talk about the club in a pretty similar way and a, and a club that has changed a lot over those generations, but have that common bond. And I think that's what we've seen with Atlanta United is, you know, you see it in the Gulch before every game, you see it in the stands, you see it after the game with the drum circles and, after the game tailgates and and stuff like that you see it at the watch parties it's people who probably wouldn't be interacting otherwise 
hanging out, talking about soccer. It's very cool. Chris Kilroy is thankful we live in a world where not only does Atlanta United exist, but it does so in a vibrant, successful way. The club wins and is ambitious and is part of transforming the sport we love in this country finally. Long way to go, but a great start. Yeah, I mean, long way to go, sure, to a degree. I mean, it's like you don't want to settle, but, man, I don't know what that long way to go is at this point. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy to, to think that way about it. I mean, you know, how much bigger does it get? I think the league has a long way to go, and it's not to, to knock it at all. It's just not every market is like Atlanta. And that's what you have to be really thankful for if you're here in Atlanta and you're following this team and, and just the excitement. Even if you're not a hardcore Atlanta United fan, if you are in Atlanta but you have allegiances to other teams, the excitement around the sport here is just such a, a cool thing at the moment that wasn't here before. And... It's not to say that it's an overnight success. It's not to say that Atlanta United created all of it. It's to say that Atlanta United, I think, took all of these different seeds that had been planted and, and allowed them to bloom. And that's what's special about it. And that's what, you know, I when I talk to Glenn Davis in Houston, it feels like every time I talk to him, he just expresses an awe for everything that is going on in the Atlanta United world and all the different things that we have to talk about on a regular basis. And they don't have that in Houston. They don't have that in other markets. It's not nonstop conversation and speculation and analysis of the local team. And that's what's so special about this is they've created a club that provokes that kind of discussion and that type of passion and not every team in MLS has done that not many have that's the big next thing for MLS to do on the Atlanta front I mean you've got to sustain it and that's not easy to do either it's very easy for things to slip you've got to you've got to sustain it and you've got to find the ways to continue to grow and in some ways it's harder when you're coming from success than if you're coming from a reboot or a rebrand, or a rebuild. So it's that's going to be the challenge for, for everybody with Atlanta United going forward is to maintain this spot, because everybody's coming for you. Katie Weaver's thankful for a team and supporters culture that embraces our city and all its diversity in history for hashtag footy mob fam, for hashtag SDH fam, for my actual family who all love the game, and of course thankful for Mourinho, hashtag C O Y S. <laughs> oh, how it's turned right now when it comes mm -hmm. to, to Jose. We'll, we'll see how long that lasts because it might not be very long because sometimes that's how it goes. New with, Year's, uh, Mr. Say Boxing Day 2021. Uh, maybe. I mean, going off past history, yeah, that's a safe safe assumption i will be the glass half full guy that i typically am and and i will say that you know he gets a good three years and he does well and he wins a trophy and that's enough and everybody's okay i think it's gonna work out okay i think you know, every time he talks i'm, I'm kind of waiting for something crazy to come out and the the ball boy thing was maybe a hint at it i i want to say that maybe he's he's learned a bit and maybe he's mellowed a bit maybe i'm just hoping that that's the case uh we'll find out it's going to be fun to watch and katie also says that her mom is having her local mexican place cater the family thanksgiving meal this that's weekend awesome. fajitas cheese dip and flan non-traditional but tasty that's awesome i the, i will go for that non-traditional plate every time I'll go Trace Leches instead of Flan, though. I'm okay. not a huge Flan fan. Uh, Trace Leches cake is amazing. ATLUTD fan number one is wishing SDH and all Atlanta United supporters a very happy Thanksgiving. We have a great team and fan base we can rally around, and for that I am forever grateful and thankful. Be safe this holiday season. Right back at you, Joe. Michael Head. 
thankful for you guys teaching me so much about the game. Thankful for Atlanta United for giving me a local team I can fully support. Thanks for Chelsea, my first soccer love. Come on, you blues. Today, Champions League! Exclamation <laughs> point. We'll see if they uh, they deliver for you today. Um, yeah, it's going to be kind of nice just getting to, to watch some Champions League. I didn't get to yesterday. I was heading up to uh, Canton, which is a, a, a long way out there for those of you who live Bit up in Canton. Bit of a trek. It's a trek for, uh, for me in the city, but it was worth it uh, talking to... New friends from Cherokee Soccer Association and Reformation Brewery and Toka about the event next week at Reformation. It is going to be big. It's it's a great fundraiser for Cherokee Soccer Association, and they have a, a wonderful foundation that will be part of this. Michael Parkhurst is going to be there, too, which is pretty cool. Uh, thanks to Toka. Thanks to CSA. So, you know... All I can tell you is, is one, if you're going to come out, if you're going to come out and hang out with us at, at Reformation on December 4th, get there early. Get there because early. Because parking is, is, it's not completely limited, but you might have to be somewhat creative in some different areas and walk a little bit. It's going to be pretty packed, so... Just telling mm-hmm. you, you want to get there early if you're coming, um, and plan a lot of drive time if you're you're coming from the city. Just telling you, just saying. Clayton Poss, who actually started it all today with the question, thank he you. Says to uh, to you, you and Mike are great for game days with calls, and I'm thankful for Champions League and the different element it brings to the fans. Conca for the Monterey. League. And Herediano away legs. It was so cool to watch and experience this different aspect of not just being two American teams. You and at Mike Conti 929 really made the Monterey match an amazing listen, amazing listen too. And being there for the home leg of Herediano may be my favorite match of all time due to the situation and the way the game played out. To see not only a well played match, but the supporters of Herediano there supporting was something I thought I'd never experience in my life. Yeah, I love the CONCACAF Champions League. I I just love the competition. I love the the interaction with different clubs that you normally wouldn't and and just how I I think warm it is for the most part emotionally with the different supporters. Like it's not you hear these stories about some different groups in, in in Champions League in Europe and and drama and fights and things and you get it some in, in Copa Libertadores too, but in CONCACAF, like, you know, you get the scenes with fans in Costa Rica exchanging jerseys. You, mm-hmm. you get a, a large number of Aradiano fans who, who come to Kennesaw for the game. You get the Atlanta and Monterey exchanges as well. And you get, I think, new fresh competition and maybe it it feels very warm because it is fresh for everybody right now but it's a it's a wonderful wonderful thing and that Aradiano second leg is is a very underrated game from 2019 in in the Atlanta United season and importance because you know you're coming in after not an awful loss in Costa Rica, but you gave up one more goal than you would have been comfortable with. If if you'd lost 2-1, you feel pretty good about coming back home. Losing 3-1, it's like, eh, okay, that's a little more to overturn. And then you get a goal in the first minute, and, and you get the performance that you got from Atlanta, and you, you flip that game on its head. Very, very big night to kick off the, the home schedule for Atlanta United. And the Monterey game... I mean, both legs of it. Both legs had drama. Both legs had a lot going on. It was a really well-played 180 minutes. And that's what CONCACAF Champions League brings to you. So now you have, in 2020, an Atlanta United side that's been through it, that that knows the challenges, knows a little bit more about what it takes, and I think is geared up to win the thing. I I think they were geared up to win it last year, but maybe they didn't know what that would take. Now they yeah. know that, and they want to win it, and they want to be the first MLS team to win it in a long, long, long time. The first one to win it in its current format, and the first one since the Galaxy in 2000 to win a, a CONCACAF trophy. Jason Heinley, 
Thanks for the insights, support, and laughs over the past year. Soccer Down Here is a part of my daily drive. I usually listen sporadically live, then uninterrupted later on with the podcast. Keep up the good work. Ah, thanks for listening. We can't do this stuff without you guys listening. It would just nope. be us talking into microphones, and that would be it. You know, it's the, the best part of the show is this type of stuff where we go back and forth, and we get comments, and we get questions, and it takes us off into tangents. That's the best part of doing this. And then you have everybody commenting on something that they see in the timeline and the conversations that you guys have amongst yourselves in addition to what we end up talking about as just the, the kickstart of things when you guys put stuff on the timeline. It's, it's really, really cool to have this. Mm-hmm. Michael Ruiz, back to Aberdeen. He says, Dion Pereira on loan to Aberdeen to get more starting 11 appearances, question mark. Would make sense to get more playing time, and being from the UK wouldn't have to worry about citizenship or visa status. Yeah, 100%. He would be one that would make a ton of sense, and it'd be very easy to loan him to Aberdeen. If, if you look at the Atlanta United depth chart for 2020 that we have so far, and you start thinking about, all right, where are the minutes going to come for, for Dion Pereira early on? If you feel like you have the depth and you have the cover and you can loan him to Aberdeen in January for six months, give him plenty of playing time over there, and then have him come back into the second half of the season for you and maybe be in a little bit different place confidence-wise getting those minutes. And I don't know Aberdeen's squad yet well enough to say like Pereira would go in and play or it's a spot that is needed. But he would be one that would immediately make sense because of the work permit issue because you don't have it. It's it's just he could slot straight in. So that's something to keep in mind with these types of situations is – the work permit thing is is an issue. It's not as big of an issue as it is with a Premier League move, but it is an issue. A guy like Pereira would be able to navigate that. Gallagher did. He's gotten that time. Does John Gallagher come back into Atlanta now at the start of 2020 and be in a very different position? We'll see. I, I'm I'm excited to see what those types of situations are going to be where you get a player who is – maybe past what they get at the Atlanta United 2 level, but they're not quite there, or there's a roadblock in front of them. And I think with Gallagher, that's more of the case, honestly, because we've watched him with Atlanta United 2 for a year and a half before he went to Aberdeen. And I've shouted him out probably for a year of that, that he can play MLS minutes for you. He can drop in and be that guy that you need. But you have Julian Gressel in front of him. You have, you know, other options on the wing in front of him. You have you're looking at him as a right back, you have Franco Escobar. If you're a wing back, you have Gressel. If you're looking at a right winger, you have, you know, Gressel, Escobar, you have Barco or Pitti who's drifted over there at times. It's not easy. So instead of staying at a level that he's shown he's done very well at, give him another challenge. And I think it's really benefited him and the fact that you're you're bringing him back in 2020 is under contract. You have the decision to make. Does he stay at Aberdeen for the rest of their season, or does he come back here into preseason and, and fight for a spot? Kind of thinking the latter with Gallagher. And maybe Pereira gets that time at Aberdeen to build his confidence up, and he comes back into the second half of the season as a different kind of player. Joe Bost says that his soccer thankfulness begins with Atlanta United, the front office, and all the 17s that I interact with here. I most likely never meet because of my crazy work life, but have given me a connection. From the bottom of my heart, I'm thankful for at Longshoe, at Soccer Down Here, for giving me some insight and knowledge into the phenomenon that is Atlanta United and soccer in general that I never would have had. It's been very cool to to talk to, to people like Joe who are are new to this or newer to this and have just jumped in with both feet digging into trades and free agency and transfer windows and loans and, and all the different nuances of running a team. 
And, and that has been one of the most exciting things for me of this whole process is it's one thing to, to be passionate about it and go to the games and love it and, and, and just love it at that surface level. But so many people who interact with us on, on SDH and interact with us on 92.9 The Game are going past that. And, and that's why the conversation around Atlanta United has gotten so much deeper. And, and there's so many more things to talk about. Because, I mean, you have the Julian Gressel situation right now and people trying to figure out what's the magic number? What's the contract number that makes sense for the team? How does it fit into the cap? Could you do something else? Could you sign him here and do this? Could you? How could you make it work? Like the type of conversations that are had about the Atlanta Falcons, that are had about the Atlanta Hawks and the Braves. Same things are being had about Atlanta United. And, and that's due to the fan base being so passionate that they want to figure out all of that stuff. I want MLS to make it easier. Uh, I want, you know better national coverage to continue to make it easier for people but the fact that so many people have just jumped in and and helped drive it it's been very cool thomas gawin wants to know if uh, jared's going to start hosting soccer up there winterfell edition thanks to the aberdeen ambsc deal yeah i think he's going to be a little torn though when when aberdeen and celtic play now um, oh He's going to have some problems with that. We'll have to see how, how Jarrett navigates it. We'll, we'll see if he checks in on, on Crumpets and Espresso this week with uh, his initial takes on that. So, uh, maybe, but that, that might be the game that breaks Jarrett. Yeah, really? I mean, that's uh, that's one that I, that I want to have, like, the, the secret camera in the corner wherever he's watching. So that way we can get his gauge his reactions as, as it continues to go. I just want to be able to watch yeah. the Scottish Premier League in a much easier yes. way because it's on BR Live, but I don't think all the games are, and I I think there is a an international streaming package that you can get for Aberdeen. Um a little pricey but i don't know yet I, I i just glanced at it looking at it try to figure out okay if i want to watch aberdeen how do i do this it's not that easy to figure out i think the international streaming package would cover the u.s and i don't think all of the aberdeen games make it to br live so i don't know how this goes um i need to figure that out and however it goes i really hope that it's just made easier going forward because i would like to jump in and learn more about aberdeen tafka's soccer thankfulness i have the pleasure of coaching wonderful kids i have an amazing club to engage with 24 7 i'm in good health and play the game at 33 years old i have selfless podcasters and journalists giving me nearly nonstop content for the game and club i love love that that Tafka is able to get out and, and coach and interact. And, and that's something we'll talk about next week with, with Cherokee soccer association is how important that is. You know, I mean, for people who are, are getting so much joy out of the game, if you have the time to be able to pass that on to kids and coach rack, or even uh, grab a whistle or, or grab a flag and get out and referee, Stuff's really, really impactful in growing the game if you have the time to do it. So, you know, it's very cool to see so many people who listen to the show and interact with us take their time to grow the game for the next generation coming up. We are officially caught up on the Twitters, sir. All right. I wanted to jump into a couple of things over at The Athletic. They are going through in, in all of their categories the best of the 2010s. And. Let's start with the 10 most important moments of the decade in U.S. soccer. So, honorable mentions. Um, Atlanta United breaking the 70,000-person MLS attendance mark. Zlatan marking his MLS debut with the ridiculous goal against LAFC in 2018. And NBC taking over Premier League broadcasts in 2013. Uh, I want to talk about Zlatan really quick because uh, I was reading a thread. So... Zlatan is, I, 
I, and I'm not 100% positive on this, it sounds like he is investing in Hammerby, one of the top clubs in Sweden. And people from his former club in Sweden, Malmo, are not happy about that at all. <laughs> and saying all kinds of things about it. So he's not making friends in uh, Sweden at the moment. <sighs> Zlatan, gonna Zlatan. The mm-hmm. the top 10 uh, for the Athletic is number 10, Landon Donovan left off the World Cup roster in 2014. Oh, I won a 30 for 30 on that one because that whole thing was insane. I, I will never forget the outcry when, when that hit and people went nuts about it. That was a big deal. That was when it was, okay, wait a minute. We can have conversations about stuff like this off the field, and people are going to be into it. So that was a little bit of a green light. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, not for Landon Donovan. He should have been on that team. That was a really stupid decision by Jurgen Klinsmann, who is now the caretaker manager at Hertha Berlin. Mm-hmm. See how that goes. Uh, Hertha, yeah. good luck to you. The... Number nine on the list, U.S., Mexico, Canada named the 2026 World Cup hosts. Massive, huge, big, 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 big. I think when we look back at it after, when we do this in in 10 years for the 2020s and the big moments, when we look back to this decade and this being on the list, it'll be higher than number nine because I think it will have a bigger impact and once we get through it and we see what it does for the growth of the game we'll look back and say man that was an even bigger deal that it was it was awarded here it was even bigger than we thought it was going to be that's that's my expectation uh number eight on the list the nwsl breaks the four season barrier I might go in a little bit different direction with that but the nwsl's sustainability is a very big deal very, very big deal because it just hadn't happened before. Uh, number seven, U.S. women file equal pay lawsuit. I think it's still up in the air a little bit as to how that's going to go and how much of the impact that's going to have, how big of a moment it's going to be. I'm going to take a little bit of a wait and see because I do want to see what the resolution is going to ultimately be there. Uh, number six, one that we kind of lose in the shuffle at times, the Justice Department taking aim at FIFA in 2015. Yes. And... Uh, Everything that came out of that, I mean, you essentially, God, I mean, how many different federation presidents in South America were indicted in this and how many people with, uh, two different people with Atlanta ties were, were indicted in this, uh, Jeffrey Webb, who had property here, uh, Mm -hmm. CONCACAF president who said he was not going to be like the previous CONCACAF representatives, and it turned out he was. Uh, And um, Aaron Davidson, who at one point with Traffic Sports was a owner of the Atlanta Silverbacks and ran the North American Soccer League. So that was a a wide-ranging thing that has changed a lot with FIFA. Maybe not as much as it ultimately could have, but there could be more to come. Yeah, and I remember the uh, the attorney general in a rather large press conference with a lot of folks. And the U.S. government at the time was not afraid to chase FIFA at all. And... Uh, you know, I, you know, is this stuff like this going to continue or you continue to try to chase after this kind of stuff or, yeah, you know, or is it just going to kind of sit by the wayside might be a couple of years. I, th- I think there will be more that comes out of it. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see a little bit. Number five on the list, Carly Lloyd scoring from midfield against Japan. I'll just take the first half of that game and how insane yeah. that world cup final was in 2015 because i mean you're celebrating one goal you're not even done celebrating yet another goal's flying in and it's just absolute chaos uh number four rapino unleashes the pose versus france 2019 that's way too high on the list and it, yeah the pose is not the, the moment here i'm sorry uh she did the randy orton pose yes and and, and randy orton's great if you're a WWE fan, you know what I'm talking about. That's great, but 
her performances in the World Cup are what deserve to be here, not unleashing the pose. I, that's completely and utterly secondary to me. Number three on the list, U.S. men failed to qualify for the World Cup in 2017. Massive, massive, huge. And if you didn't have the moments that are one and two, and I agree with the breakdown of this. I think this is the right order. It would be number one any other decade if you didn't have the Landon Donovan goal against Algeria and if you didn't have the Abby Wambach goal against Brazil. I would flip them. I would put Donovan one and Wambach two, and the main reason why is the U.S. women had moments before like this. Now, it's a different era, but 1999 in the United States, you won a World Cup. And people remember Brandy Chastain. And people remember that moment. You didn't have a moment like that on the men's side, period. And the Landon Donovan goal against Algeria, for me, was Lake Placid for the men's soccer program. It was the thing. It's like you remember where you were. You remember how it went down. You remember everything about it. You didn't have that before, and you did on the women's side. That's why I would flip them. It was more unexpected for that moment at that time on the men's side than it was on the women as well. Both were unbelievable soccer moments. But I'm going to put the Donovan one ahead of the Wambach one just because the men had never had that moment, never had that signature moment that you think of the you know again back to wrestling for a second the 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 promo or the intro video with the 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 now forever and all the great moments like if you do that for u.s soccer if that's your intro to a u.s soccer broadcast and it's all these great moments you're ending it with the donovan goal that's the sign that's the end moment of the montage yeah and before, I don't know what that would have been. The Wombat goal is not the end moment of the montage for the women. It's lifting the World Cup trophy in 99. It's it's probably Brandy Chastain scoring the winning penalty. Yeah. yeah. That's probably the end moment in the montage. But the Donovan one, until the men win a World Cup, that's the end moment. That's the one. So that's why it's got to be number one for me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you because of of context and meaning and importance and all those things. For me, Donovan was one and Wambach was two. I mean, the, neither one won the, the World Cup after that. Both lost their, their next game. The, the, the men lost to, to Ghana in the round of 16. The women lost that World Cup final after the Wambach header and, and got them to the final. So I'm going to go... Donovan won Wombat two, and yep. uh, that's just how it felt for me. But flip a coin; both are huge moments, and and in a different decade, either one would be number one. You wouldn't really have any complaints about it. the The last one I wanted to touch on really quick before we wrap up the six worst designated player signings of the decade in MLS. Okay, uh, Frank Rost, who was a goalkeeper for the Red Bulls, he made. 11 MLS appearances and he retired after his season at Red Bulls. Wow. So he was okay. I mean, he was okay. Like he wasn't, uh, it's a little harsh to put him here because he wasn't bad for the Red Bulls, but he was just okay. Um, number four, and it's a tie, Innocent Emigara, who was bad for San Jose. Just bad. One goal in 13 appearances for the Quakes from 2015 to 2016. He went 29 games as an unused sub. Wow. (laughs) I mean, bad. Uh, Neri Castillo for the Chicago Fire, really, really bad because he was expected to be the Cuauhtémoc Blanco replacement both on the field but also in the stands with the – the Mexican fans for Chicago and he was bad on the field and it didn't translate off the field either. Eight games. That's it. Uh, Ross and for Philadelphia, which 
made no sense because they had young goalkeepers coming through and I think that was the first time that Zach McMath got roadblocked by a goalkeeper and you had Andre Blake coming through too and you go get Mboli who just wasn't that good. One four and four in his nine games. Ugh, That's why do you waste the money? Uh, Steven Gerrard, number two, I completely agree with it. He was just yeah. awful in MLS. It was just sad to watch, and he looked like he did not care. Uh, I, I disagree with – I'm trying to remember who it was here who mentioned. Oh, uh, Adam Snavely mentioned about Lampard. Lampard delivered on the field for NYC. Now, the the whole thing with him not coming at the start of 2015 and coming in the middle – because Manchester City wanted to keep him. That that puts a, a black eye on it. But Lampard scored 15 goals. He had some moments for NYC. Gerard had nothing. I mean, it was just bad. Bad for him in the LA Galaxy. Rafa Marquez is number one. And if, if you have not seen the Rafa Marquez just ridiculousness when he was with the Red Bulls. Oh. Oh. I mean, <laughs> red cards and playoff games from just acting a fool. Um, cheap shots, just everything you can imagine. He he was, you know, just trashing MLS on every opportunity he could get on the way out the door. It was awful. Uh, Rafa Marquez was, I agree, the worst. Um, I believe, and I'm not going crazy, I believe they did a revote from when I saw this before the show started because Denilson from Dallas was on the list. <laughs> and, okay, it, 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 Alexander Abnos did update it. Um, Denilson was on the list. He did not even get into the honorable mentions. Um, he was what? in 2007, 2007, 2007. Okay. That's not 2010s. So that's why he no, was no, on no. there initially. So that's why it's correct to take him off. But worst designated players ever, ever? Yeah, he's number one for me. So Denilson was the worst? Yes, ever, but not in the 2010s because he didn't play right. in the 2010s. Yeah, so Denilson was the worst. That's terrible. Figured we end the week on a note like that. Terrible. Goodness. That's how you want to end the week? Well, no, I thought we were going to talk about what we were thankful for before we signed off. Okay. Then you end it with that. Okay. Well, I mean, just normally what I'll do on my personal Facebook page is I'll post something. And it's the same thing that I post every year, but it always holds true. You know, it's you're thankful for friends. You're thankful for family. You're thankful for your plot in life. And knowing full well that there are those who are profoundly less fortunate than we all are. And they're, they're having their struggles all year long. But I know that a lot of folks will focus on the holiday season and, and remind everyone that, you know, there are those who are, are fighting battles every single day. And it's at home. It's away from home. It's about work. It's about a bunch of different things. But. Just at the same time, keep thoughts for those folks in as much as you're going to be apart with your families as well. And I'm thankful for all of my friends, thankful for my family. And a lot of folks will sit there and say that you can't choose your family. But I would always maintain that you can. You have the family that's uh, that you're born with but you also have the, the family that you grow with. And that includes, it includes you, Jason. And, and I mean that in all seriousness. And, you know, you have friends that you develop over time and you, you will drop anything. If that person texts you or calls, if something goes wrong, that's the family that I'm talking about. I'm thankful for everything in a professional sense. I'm really, really lucky to have what I have and with what we've been able to build here as a part of this community. And along that same line, I'm thankful that honestly you put up with me as much as you do because 
I'm learning. I do not have the knowledge base that you have, and you are, for all intents and purposes, my oracle when it comes to learning what's going on. And so I'm thankful for your levels of patience that you exude, not just on the air, but you know when we're having conversations and things like that. So be thankful for everything that you have and just understand also at the same time that there are those around you who are struggling and understand what they're going through and lend an ear, lend a shoulder, lend a hand. And sometimes they may not ask for it, but just to just be there for others too. So that's, that, that's my, that is my thought pattern here on a, on a Wednesday as we head toward Thanksgiving. Thanks to all of you guys who listen and take time out of your busy days and lives to seek out what, we have to say about important stuff when it comes to the game about food thoughts about uh music thoughts about whatever um it's it's very cool that people care what we think about with any of this stuff and, and take the time to listen and even you know when we do special events people coming out and supporting people coming out and you know wanting to get a scarf people wanting to represent you know, what we do here at SDH and all the people who go out of their way to listen to the games on, on nine eighty nine the game, to to watch the twos on ESPN plus, to to seek out the games, you know, over at Oglethorpe and the high school finals and, and everything that I'm doing. People just going out of their way to, to seek it out and, and to listen and watch. It's it's very cool, it's very humbling, it's it's very special. Mm-hmm. I would have never, ever, ever guessed that that would have been the case when all of this got started. And I'm just thankful every day that it is. And I'm thankful for all of you guys who have become part of this large soccer family. And it is a family and it does feel like a family. So thanks to everybody who is part of that. And thanks to everybody who is part of, of SDH because it's not just about us who, who talk on a microphone it's about everybody who listens too so thank you for being part of it um enjoy the holiday enjoy the time with the people that you spend it with and we'll be back with you on monday live but we'll have some other content coming for you later today and, and over the break so it's a busy time um be safe be careful and and take the time and spend it the way that that you want to that makes you feel good about it so we'll be back on monday thanks everybody mucha plata y'all happy thanksgiving y'all